Then you're live. Thanks, uh, Dorinda. Uh, I will go ahead and call this uh, March 13th meeting of the Transportation Policy Board uh, to order. And Mark, do you want to do introductions? I will do so. Uh, let's start with the City of Olympia. City of Olympia, Robert Vanderpool. And uh, City of Tonino. John O'Callaghan, representing the great City of Tonino. And Yelm? Uh, Tracy Wood, representing the thriving metropolis of Yelm. And State Department of Transportation. Gaius Hanoi, Olympic Region. Morning, Gaius. Um, business Representative McKeegan Jensen. I am here. Hi, everyone. And our chair for today. Uh, I'm Renee Ratcliffe Sinclair, a business rep representing TVW. And business representative Wasson. Dave Wasson, representing Dancing Goats Coffee. Community Rep Murray. Hi, I'm Michelle Murray, community representative. And community rep Millar. Morning, Travis Millar, community rep. Oh, all right, let me just check page two real quick to see if anyone else came in that I missed. No, that is who we have. Um, Katrina Van Every can do uh, staff introductions if you'd like, Chair. That'd be great. Thank you. Great. Good morning. Uh, from Thurston County, we have Becky Kahn from the City of Olympia, Sophie Stimson, and Michelle Swanson from Inner City Transit, uh, Peter Stackpole. And from TRPC, in addition to Mark and myself, we have Sarah Porter, Dorinda Merrill, Allison Osterberg, Berlina Lucas, uh, Paul Brewster, and Theresa Julius. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, do we have any guests today that we need to introduce? We do have guests for our agenda items, but okay. we can introduce, introduce them as them they later. Got yes. it. Um, if everyone's had a chance to take a look at the agenda, I would entertain a motion to approve it. So entertained. Thank you, John. Do we have a second? Second for Michelle Murray. Thanks, Michelle. All those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Thank you. And uh, we have an agenda. And have we had a chance to take a look at the consent calendar for today? Move approval. Thank you, John. Do we okay. have a second? Tracy would. Thanks, Tracy. All those in favor, please say hi. Wave your hand. Aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. And we have approved the consent calendar. Um, and we don't have any public comments for today, so we'll move right into our proposed amendment to the Regional Transportation Improvement Program. And Sarah, you are up. Great. Thanks, Renee. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Porter, and I am a planner here at TRPC. This agenda item is to review the proposed amendment to the 2024-2027 Regional Transportation Improvement Program called the RTIP. Uh, as a reminder, the RTIP is a four-year list of near-term transportation projects, which is updated annually. In between these updates, when new projects are added or substantial project changes are made, they go through the amendment process. The City of Olympia has requested an amendment to the 2024-2027 RTIP for the following project. It's called Pacific State and 4th Street Chip Seal, and there is a request to add this project into the RTIP as a new project. Um, more project detailed information was included in your meeting packet. So in order for funds to be released for this project, amendments must be made to the RTIP and then forwarded to the State Transportation Improvement Plan called the STIP. Public comment was solicited on TRPC's website and none was received. Are there any questions on the amendment? If so, we do have stuff available. Do we have any questions about the RTIP amendment? 
I'm looking for hands and I don't see any. You want to move for want to move for approval? Yes, we do need a motion. Thank you, John. And do we have a second? Second, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. All those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion has been approved. We are just cruising along this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we will hear now about the non-driver population analysis and um, Mary Ann and Anna. And and Chair, while they're while they're bringing up their materials, we uh, I we did uh, skip over the executive director, and I've just got a couple oh, of I'm announcements. So sorry, no, that, that's okay. fine. Uh, just want to make sure that that uh, because one of them is about our next meeting, and so want to make sure to remind everybody that um, our next meeting, April tenth is in person. Um, the policy board, just as a reminder, and for those that are new, um, since uh, since the pandemic and we were meeting remotely, the policy board um, has continued to re meet remotely and has kept that uh, the meetings pretty much strictly remote. Um, but this year, the officers and policy board as a whole ag agreed that for some of the key meetings, like talking about um, programming federal funds, what we refer to as the call for projects, that it would be good to have in-person uh, meetings. We'll always still have a hybrid option, a Zoom option, um, but looking to get um, uh, some some people together at TRPC. So that is a reminder. We'll we'll it'll be in the agenda with the address and everything. We'll probably send out another reminder because it's been a long time since we've met in person. But April 10th meeting in person at our offices um, at TRPC. And then the other piece is my uh, executive director's evaluation is going on right now. Um, love to get as much feedback uh, as possible on that. Um, Berlina will be sending out right now the the we're we're doing the staff evaluation of, of my performance. Um, and so on Monday, March 25th, Berlina will be sending out to all of the policy board and the council uh, the opportunity to weigh in on, on my annual evaluation. And please take the opportunity. I really value getting everybody's feedback on this. And so look for that coming March 25th. And if you could take a few minutes to, to provide some input on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. And now with that, we can we can move on to, to the agenda item. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, I apologize for stepping over you. And Not at now, all. Now we'll hear about uh, our non-drivers analysis. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for having Anna and I here to talk to you about the non-driver study. So um, I will get to the slides. And I guess um, we have about 25-ish minutes of presentation content and then time for discussion. Um, I will not, I think I won't be able to monitor the chat, but if you have a question as we go, go ahead and, and type it in the chat and um, happy to respond if it's a clarification point or we can save discussion for the end. Um, sorry to interrupt, just an FYI, we do not have chat in the- Oh, agenda. we do not have chat, okay, yeah. great, thank you. So, so people can raise their hands and I'll they can keep raise their hand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I'll introduce myself and then I'll let Anna just, uh, introduce herself. I'm Marianne Rosance. I'm a senior associate with Cascadia Consulting Group. Um, most of my work at Cascadia is in climate resilience and climate uh, vulnerability assessments, all things climate, climate impacts in the Pacific Northwest. I am a social scientist, which is why I was invited to this um, amazing research team led by Tool Design. Um, so it would be, I have to say that Manuel Soto was the project manager for the larger project. I'll be talking about the survey and Anna will be talking about her work with Disability Rights Washington and how it, how it connects to the survey. Um, but Manuel has just started a new position and is no longer at Tool Design, so couldn't, couldn't be here. Um, 
I just wanted to add that through this work, I have learned a lot about non-drivers and I hope you will leave here today also knowing more about non-drivers. And um, in um, climate resilience and hazard planning, they are not all, they're often left out of conversation. So I was at a two day meeting in a story yesterday, just talking about coastal hazards and tsunami. And there was no mention of, of non-drivers and how we're gonna get them out of evacuation, you know, and evacuation um, plans as well. So it intersects in a lot of areas beyond transportation planning. And um, this work has really shed that uh, light for me. So I'll turn it over to, Anna to do a brief intro. Uh, good morning, everyone. Anna Zivarts here. I work for Disability Rights Washington. Um, we're a disability rights organization that does statewide work. And uh, I direct a program within Disability Rights Washington focused on the mobility needs of non-drivers. And I'm based in Seattle, um, but I grew up in Olympia. And I'll, I'll talk a little more in my section about my uh, background and, and why I do this work. Turning it back over to Mary. I should say I am based in Seattle. Okay, so um, I'll give you a brief overview of the full Washington Joint Transportation Committee non-driver study. Um, Cascadia Consulting Group was hired to do the statewide survey and the market research portion, including focus groups of this, and then the analysis. So I'm gonna focus on that. And then we'll hear from Anna um, with Disability Mobility Initiative and some uh, research that they've been doing as well as testimonials. Okay, so for an overview of the study, it was led by Tool Design Group. We supported um, the market research study, which I'll dive into the results, and then Strate Strategic Research Associates. They led the, the um, survey sampling, so they administered the survey to make sure it was balanced representation across the state. We also had a uh, Joint Transportation Committee uh, work, staff work group. Um, we met four times over the course of this study. It was actually a fast and furious timeline, I believe over about an eight month period. Um, so we met and uh, got, got input throughout the different key stages of the project planning phases. So where did this come from? The Washington State Legislator directed um, the Joint Transportation Committee to conduct a study to estimate how many non-drivers are in Washington State the demographics of this non-driver population, and as well as identifying the availability of transportation options for non-drivers and those um, and the impacts that those options have on access to daily life activities. So this was done in three main steps. First, um, tool design led this uh, use of census and um, other data to identify the different population groups that make up non-drivers in Washington State. And then uh, Cascadia Consulting, um, identified the demographics and mobility needs through a survey of non-drivers in Washington state, doing the statistically significant sampling and representation. And then tool design led this um, analysis of the availability of transportation options and um, through mapping. And then, but what we did was we, we looked at the impact of those different options on non-drivers access to daily life opportunities through the survey. So there was, both a mapping element as well as the survey element. Great, and so the summary report and appendices and the publicly available interactive map and database are the products. Okay, um, so for the non-driver population groups, we had to put some parameters on this, right? So it's individuals who are too young to get a license, individuals who are of age to get a license are 16 but don't have a license, individuals that don't do not own or lease a vehicle, but they may have a driver's license. And then we also considered licensed drivers that have shared access to a vehicle or are not the primary driver of the household vehicle. Um, and I'll just add that we use those specific screening questions in the survey, um, making sure that we are identifying our non-driver population. So just to run through, and these share these slides we didn't cast uh, tool led, so I'm just going to run through them, and then you can have them to reference. Um, but just to give you an idea of the demographic estimate of non-drivers, um, so you know there are there are roughly 7.7 .7 million residents in Washington State. 6.3 of those are eligible for a license. Um, you know, one one point four. That means that our some are too young to drive, right? So that's about eighteen percent of the state's population, and we have five point eight million licensed drivers. 
Um, so here we have um, the total licensed drivers and the percent of age group that's licensed. So it gives you a sense that more of the non-drivers, right, are typically younger, but we also have this category of young adults, 20 to 34, where we have a significant, you know, a larger per percentage of non-drivers compared to adults 35 and 65, and then it declines again as seniors. Great. So the percentage of the estimate for non-drivers do not have a driver's license, 6.2%. Do not have a vehicle, 5.2%. But there's a lot of caveats with the data um, that we get that the report explains. And then the population range, some, you know, an estimate of non driver population is somewhere between 6.2 and 11%, 11 and a half, 11.4%. Okay, and then I'll just show you the, a couple slides that show the analysis of impact of transportation options before we get into the survey. And this is just to look at a higher level of understanding of locations of services and facilities for different life opportunities and then different transportation modes. So if you were driving a car, how long would it take you to access certain things like employment, um, school, things like that? If you were walking, what's your what's the time for access, riding a bike, and public transit transit? And so I will uh, I know there's no chat, so I will follow up in an email with Allison. Um, and share the links to these maps if you don't have them already, because they are interactive and you can go look more specifically right at Thurston County. Um, but essentially how it works is it just shows the different transportation time. So driving to access a job site pretty much everywhere in the state, um, people have access uh, minus a few places have access to a job opportunity within 13 minute drive or 30 minutes not 13 30 minutes of driving right but when you go looking at bicycles access becomes more limited and then when you go looking at uh transit uh, or wa walking to job sites it becomes more limited and then transit access and minutes and travel time becomes more limited as well and similarly, it was done for healthcare and other life opportunities. So these are interactive maps that are available online. Um, you know, I think just some key analysis findings from this mapping activity. So access to vehicle provides most almost universal access to these light daily life activities statewide. So cars are still essential for accessing daily life opportunity. Um, the lowest you know, level of access is found in more rural counties for short trips or no more than 15 minutes, um, right? So we can access a lot of things with our car. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about, give you an overview of the market research statewide survey, which was led by Cascadia Consulting Group. Um, and then again, just to re, re remind us how this survey ties into the to the overall project. So this survey was conducted to gather statewide information from Washington state non-drivers. Here we did ages 18 and up, right? So that we can better understand their demographics and available transportation options. So the survey focused on demographics, their reasons for not driving, mobility and access, or um, how non-drivers get around and the usability of different transportation options and the accessibility of life activities and then the impact that uh, that travel access has on non-drivers. So we conducted the survey both on the phone and online with Spanish and English offered on the phone and multiple languages offered online. Um, so the screening questions needing for needing to be a non-driver required a lot of effort to identify responders, right? So to give you an idea, over 50,000 phone numbers were dialed in this effort and um, through the phone survey, we only received 76 completed surveys. So it took a huge effort to identify non-drivers in this process. Um, we did that focus on balancing efforts across the state, right? To have representation across the counties and not to um, just have urban and Puget Sound area counties dominating the response. Um, so we focused on getting this balance of urban versus rural counties. And in addition to the survey, we did conduct three focus groups with urban, rural, and disabled non-drivers um, representing different uh, balance of different demographic uh, characteristics. Okay, um, so who are the non-drivers 18 and over in Washington state? 
So non-driver survey respondents were more likely to be female than male. So compare when, um, and this is true when we compared to with the 2020 census data. Um, survey respondents also tended to be younger with 70% between the age of 18 and 44. And this occurred, you know, we really did um, have considerable efforts to connect with seniors via so phone surveys where we typically see more seniors responding, um, you know, without, without those types of screening questions. Um, survey respondents also tend to be lower income compared to the overall state population. They also tend to have a higher household size and are more likely um, to rent a house or apartment rather than own. Um, in addition to demographic questions, we also ask survey respondents what their reasons are for non-driving. And survey respondents could select multiple reasons, right, to that, that apply to their context. So the top two most frequently selected uh, reasons relate to cost. 40% selected the cost of purchasing, operating, and maintaining a vehicle are too high. And 28% said the cost of the vehicle registration and or the insurance are too high. 18% said they have a disability or condition that prevents or limits their driving. And while there isn't an exact comparison from the American Community Survey or the census, um, this proportion is not that different from some of the 2020 estimates. Only 17% selected that they prefer a lifestyle without a ca car, followed by 14% that they don't know how to drive or have a cost barrier to obtaining a license. Um, just wanted to note, it's not shown here, but the report does get into how reasons for not driving do vary by demographic characteristic. So cost, um, those selecting, um, uh, so for cost, um, male, younger, lower income, urban, and physically abled non-drivers were more likely than, fem than their counterparts, female, older, higher income, rural, and disabled non-drivers to identify cost as a reason for non-driving. Um, when it came to lifestyle, choosing a preferring a lifestyle without a car, male, younger, urban, and higher income uh, non-drivers were more likely to select lifestyle preference than their female, older, rural, and lower income. And I'll go into um, the different mobility options and access to life opportunities. So across all travel destinations, um, the three most common modes of transportation. So here we at we ask where you know, how do you get to your education and employment? How do you get to your childcare? How do you you know what? How do you access food and groceries, recreation, social, family, and spiritual and medical health care? Right. So and across all the different travel destinations, the three most common modes of transportation are receiving car rides from friends or family, um, taking a fixed route bus or train, and walking and rolling. So not sure, shown here is how the level of access to different life uh, activities, which didn't really differ too much, right? But medical and health care did stand out as being more difficult to access than the others. Okay, um, so just digging into some of this a little bit more, uh, car driven by friends and family was generally the easiest to use, followed by walking and rolling and fixed route bus or train, which kind of makes sense since that's what they said, how they said they're getting around. This is tip, this tended to be the easiest to use. Um, the ease of use for these different transportation options did vary by demographic characteristics, again. So male, younger, higher income, urban, and physically abled non-drivers said that many of these transportation modes are easier to use compared to their female, older, lower income, rural, and disabled peers. At the same time, older non-driver survey respondents said that they do not need to use transportation options um, more often than their younger survey respondent counterparts. Um, the another important part of this market research is to understand the impact of travel access and options. And so I'll share a brief overview, but this was an area that was looked into more detail in the focus groups and an area that Anna will um, touch on in, in her work with Disability Rights Washington. 
So in the survey, people were asked about how their status as a non-driver and or travel options impacted their travel behavior. And over 70% said that they had travel plans negatively impacted at least one time in the past 30 days. 23% of surveyed non-drivers skip going somewhere at least once a week or more often because of transportation. 22% are late getting somewhere at least once a week or more often. 34% worry about being able to get somewhere at least once a week or more often. 39% worry about inconveniencing friends or family at least once a week or more often. And this last piece about worrying um, related to inconveniencing friends or family is important considering that that is the main mode of transportation for non-drivers in this survey. So this really came up in context of hardship during the focus groups um, and with disabled participants and rural participants in particular. So when we looked at these uh, impacts by demographic characteristics, um, females, younger, lower income, and lower income non-drivers were more impacted compared to their male, older, and higher income peers. And just, um, you know, just to summarize, since that was a lot of information and there's lots of other ways to, to think about the survey data, um, but I just wanted to kind of leave you with a few takeaways from this market research survey before I hand it over to Anna. So non-driver survey respondents were more likely to be female, younger, lower income, and from larger uh, size households compared to the Washington state population. Non-drivers have different reasons, right? They're not homogenous. They have different reasons for not driving, and they also have different travel behaviors. Um, we can also say you know, we can confirm from this survey that non-drivers access to life opportunities and quality of life is impacted by their status as a non-driver and the available transportation options to them. And we can also say that there are demographic differences and how they are impacted by their non-drivers status. And just an overall kind of key message is those living in rural areas, females, lower income, disabled and younger respondents tended to be more impacted by their non-driver status across the different questions that we asked um, than other respondents. So that's the non-driver study and survey overview. And I'll turn it over to Anna from Disability Rights Washington. I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome. I love hearing this presentation. Um, <laughs> and it's been really uh, awesome to partner um, on, on this work. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen now. Um, one second while I get that rolling. And let's see, I'm going to try to make this full screen. All right. Um, so yeah, this, this work is, ooh, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, this work is really exciting to me uh, because I am myself a non-driver and um, I have a picture here. This is the, the road uh, I grew up on in Olympia, uh, which is out in, you know, sort of part by Evergreen, um, rural Thurston County uh, ish area, no sidewalks, about two miles to the nearest bus stop. And as uh, growing up here, I felt pretty isolated uh, as a teenager, as my friends got driver's licenses and could go do things. I had to, you know, rely on my parents or friends for rides everywhere. And um, I, I felt really stuck. And so uh, after college, I left, I moved to New York City. And this image on the right is a picture I took in New York City. And you can just see very different um, environment, lots of pedestrians, lots of pedestrians just kind of crossing the street when they want to. I didn't even realize until afterwards that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people just, um, you know, in the street. And uh, being in New York was awesome for me because I, I have a, an eye condition that, you know, I, I have some vision, but I do not have enough vision to uh, drive a vehicle. And in New York, most people don't own cars. Most people don't get around driving themselves. And so in many ways, my, my disability wasn't so visible because it just didn't limit um, what I needed uh, or could do. You didn't see job postings that required driver's license. It was, it was pretty rare to have a vehicle. Um, but then uh, after the birth of my son, we decided to move back to the Pacific Northwest. And, um, you know, I, I was afraid to come back here, to be really honest, because I knew that 
I would suddenly experience a lot more limitations um, because of my disability. And I started working for Disability Rights Washington doing media advocacy work and right away heard from a lot of other folks who couldn't drive, couldn't afford to drive, um, were aging out of driving, had disabilities that prevented them from driving. And, um, and so that really became the work that I got to focus on. And that's how the Disability Mobility Initiative and our work around non-drivers got started is I, you know, growing up, I had felt completely alone. I didn't know other adults who didn't drive. And I think part of that is because so many people who can't drive are, um, you know, limited in where they can go. They're stuck at home. They're socially isolated. And so, you know, unless you can afford to live in a big city, um, your your mobility is really uh, challenged often. And so um, with the work with the Mobility Initiative, uh, we started interviewing non-drivers from all over the state. And these are some images of, of some of the work we've been doing um, for the past four years uh, in different places where, where folks, you know, are experiencing challenges because of the way we built our, our communities to be so reliant on cars to get where we need to go. Um, but this work has been exciting for me because it's also been, all right, you know, there, there are a lot of people who aren't served by this car mobility. How can we rethink our communities so that it's not such a requirement uh, to, to, you know, be included in community? Uh, and the non-driver study, I think, was a real affirmation of, you know, the existence of non-drivers and also that non-drivers, you know, I think there's a sort of stereotype that right there, the, you know, the urbanist bros, the tech bros who live in Seattle and ride, you know, scooters and can afford, you know, that, that lifestyle. But the reality is that many non-drivers and the non-drivers that are least able to access and most limited in, in what they can do are uh, lower income, are women, are younger folks. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of equity issues there to, to look at. Um, so this is a, an image of uh, some of the, the story map that we did documenting in interviews. I think we have around 300 interviews with non-drivers from every legislative district in the state. This is an image of my uh, colleague Abby and I doing outreach at an event, speaking to uh, folks who were recently immigrated from Afghanistan and Iraq about their uh, experiences as um, immigrants and not being able to drive in sort of the South King County area. Um, so just a, a couple of notes about non-drivers that I think are, are important. And this is um, you know national statistics, um, but I think it's it's relevant for Washington State. Um, but we know that people with disabilities are four times more likely not to be able to drive than non-disabled people. Um, research also shows uh, that we use buses, subways, and commuter rail for a higher share of trips than people without disabilities. Um, and I think, you know, there's this assumption, I think, or, or a correlation, you know, in people's minds between disability and like a disabled parking, park, parking placard. Um, but that, you know, that, that is only some portion of the disability community that has access to vehicles. There's many people who don't have that access. Um, and there are all kinds of disabilities that can prevent driving. And I think, you know, obviously people like me who are low vision or blind, um, that's a reason not to drive. Um, but also people with mobility disabilities. Yes, there are some, you know, adaptions with vehicle design that you can get, you know, made to your vehicle, but those are expensive. They don't work for everyone. Um, also people with epilepsy or mental health disabilities um, uh, or, or chronic health conditions like chronic fatigue that can't drive or can't drive um, when they're having bad days or flare ups. Um, there's also, you know, it, it's not a strict binary, and I think this is an important thing to sort of dig into. Um, this is an image of Erica on the right, and she has a disability that, um, you know, she uses a, a power chair, and um, and she can drive, and but she can't afford a vehicle that that allows her power chair to go into it because that's an expensive. Uh, expensive vehicle that she can't afford. And so she has a car and she can get in her car and drive to drive through services, but she's not able to get out of her vehicle and, you know, walk into a restaurant or um, an activity, right? And so if she wants to leave her car, um, she she takes she takes her power chair and she takes transit. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, it, there's not these like strict lines where there's folks who can drive, you know, on, on good days when they're not having flare-ups, but on other days they can't. Um, and so that there's a lot of complexity and nuance here, um, but also that there's um, nuance in the fact that not everyone who has a disability um, or can't drive because of a disability, they may not identify as disabled either. And I think that's that's important to, to recognize. Um, for example, there are many people with anxiety around driving 
that prevents them from driving or prevents them from driving in certain conditions. Perhaps it's PTSD, uh, they're veterans or from a, a crash or um, some experience when they were learning to drive or just you know uh, anxiety more broadly. Um, and they may not identify that as a disability, but you know, in, in many ways they're not able to drive um, because of that. Um, I also uh, just want to touch a little bit more on the, this idea of youth and children. Uh, I know that you know the survey uh, focused on adults, uh, you know, people over the age of eighteen, um, but there's also a lot of younger folks um, who are choosing not to drive and increasingly choosing not to drive. And there's some statistics here. This was from a Washington Post article that was based on um, Federal Highways data uh, that showed that 25% of 16-year-olds had driver's licenses uh, in 2020 compared to 43% in 1997, um, which is a big change um, and big decrease in the number of 16-year-olds that are you know, choosing to get driver's licenses. Um, older youth as well. Um, there's a, a note here, 20 to 25-year-olds. Um, 80% have, have driver's licenses compared to 90% in 1997. Um, and then this image here on the bottom, this is another Thurston County image. Uh, I, I think this is, you know, something kind of unique to Washington State. I haven't seen it in other places, but the bus shelters um, for kids waiting for the school bus in more rural areas. And I, I just think it's a really important visual reminder of how much, you know, there are many people in our communities that can't drive but still need to go places. And, you know, we create systems to allow students to get to school, um, but just recognizing that that children have mobility needs as well. And when we're not, you know, when they're not able to go there by themselves, um, when we don't provide, uh, you know, busing, those, those, you know, mobility needs fall on parents and caregivers. And, um, if those parents and caregivers can drive, that's great. If they can't, there are really inequitable outcomes um, to, to, you know, children's well-being. Um, all right, so I'm going to keep on moving along here. Oops. There we go. Um, so, yeah, talking about involuntary non-drivers in particular, um, uh, I think uh, uh, Mary talked a lot about this, um, you know, the, the, it, the equity implications of who has access to driving and who doesn't. The work that we do at Disability Rights Washington is really focused on involuntary non-drivers and, and you know, the choices that we have and how can we create communities that work better um, for involuntary non-drivers and really listening to the needs of folks who don't have the option to grab the keys and go where we want to go. Um, so uh, some of the, the those key pieces um, include, you know, really thinking about, okay, while it may be possible for people to rely on their social networks to get rides and ask for rides, and that's something that many non-drivers do because it's, you know, easier sometimes to get a ride than wait three hours to take a bus somewhere, um, if that bus exists, um, there isn't a real emotional burden of that. And these are a couple of quotations from folks uh, that we've interviewed about that emotional burden. Um, from Matt from Puyallup says he's 28, he likes to go places. Um, this is the, the image on the right is Jaime, who lives in, in, in the Tri-Cities and talks about, you know, the depression he's felt um, since he was, uh, had a brain seizure and wasn't able to drive anymore and what it was like to, um, you know, that, that isolation was similar to what people experienced in the pandemic. Um, I also think another really important piece here is thinking about housing, land use, and the proximity of where we need to go to where we can afford to live. And we all know that the housing crisis has forced people who have less income, less wealth, oops, uh, to, to move further and further out. Um, this is an image from uh, the Vancouver area, from Clark County, um, and Chris, who this is, uh, she's blind and she's getting to her nearest bus stop. And, you know, it's a real challenge for her uh, to find housing that's anywhere near transit. And she did, but the, you know, that sidewalk connection just doesn't exist. Um, so really thinking about how we can build housing and affordable housing near transit service, near where there are connected pedestrian networks um, for people to, to get places. And then this last piece I really wanna talk about is the importance of um, that, that sidewalk connectivity and what happens when it doesn't exist. This image on the left is of Tanisha. She works with me in, here in Seattle and 
And this is her rolling in the street next to some pretty gnarly freight traffic because the sidewalks aren't accessible. There's not curb ramps. The sidewalks are cracked up, covered with loose gravel. And with her power wheelchair, you know, she, she really risks flipping. Um, and that's super dangerous. Uh, we can also talk about snow and snow clearing. Not that it snows all the time here, but when it does, um, I found the Northwest is particularly bad about caring about pedestrians. This image here is my neighborhood where someone did a very nice job of clearing their driveway and uh, didn't bother with the sidewalks. Um, and then thinking about, you know, crossings and especially crossings of arterials, of crossings um, where we have slip lanes to our freeway on ramps and off ramps. What is that experience like for pedestrians and how how can we get safely across these areas? This is something that we hear about all the time. Um, I will paste in, the, or I will share with you all, I guess there's no chat, but this is a video from, um, from Olympia, from the Lacey area, actually. Uh, this is Mitch, he lives in Lacey, and, um, you know, talks about how, you know, how challenging it is to cross some of these curb ramps, uh, these bumps in his um, wheelchair, and also some of the, the issues with older um, pedestrian infrastructure, like curb ramps that are sort of aiming him out into traffic. Um, and, and really high speed gnarly traffic. So I, I suggest you watch that video when you have a chance. We have a whole playlist of videos from around the state. So thinking about solutions, uh, what we're really asking for is a seat at the table, um, listening to non-drivers, making sure that non-drivers are included in decision-making processes. Um, often it's really hard for us to um, to run for elected office because you know our, our, our communities are so car dependent and getting places takes so long if you don't have a car. Um, but thinking about how can you bring in other voices that aren't already at the table? Um, what would it take, whatever your position is, um, to, to you know ask who isn't here and what could I do to have those voices included? Uh, and one, one way we ask people to think about that is our Week Without Driving Challenge. And this image is uh, King County Council uh, last year did a, an official proclamation for the Week Without Driving. Um, this, is a, this year it will be at the end of September, September uh, 30th through October 6th. Um, and the idea is that we ask elected leaders, we ask policymakers, we ask practitioners like you all to take a week and try to get around without driving yourself. Um, you can get rides, you can ask for rides, you can ride the bus, you can walk, you can bike. Um, but really thinking about what choices you have, um, how would someone without those choices um, be able to manage? And if you do have to drive, that's okay. Um, but just reflecting on that choice. Um, and these are a couple of quotes from folks from the Thurston County area who participated in the past. Hillary Seidel from the Olympia School Board. Uh, you know, had some really interesting feedback for us after she participated around, you know, thinking about, you know, school events and when those are scheduled and are there, is there actually bus service running still um, for folks? And then Robin Vasquez from uh, Lacey um, was a terrific participant and had, you know, really thinking about connections and, and, and getting around with kids too, I think is something that um, I'm a mom and I know it can be a real challenge. A lot of kid events are, you know, not near transit or there's not bike parking or the sidewalks and the lighting are just awful. Um, so how do you make it possible for folks who, you know, can't afford, afford a car, can't afford to drive, can't drive um, to participate fully in community? So a uh, week without driving now, it's this is our fourth year. Uh, we did it two years here in Washington in state. Last year, we partnered with America Walks and it went national. Um, I think we had, let's see, over 400 advocates from 41 states in Washington, D.C., which was really tremendous. We're trying to hit all 50 states this year. So if you know anyone in North Dakota, uh, let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we had over 90 media uh, stories. Um, and there's a really terrific, uh, you can check out the website. You can read some of those articles, some really tremendous coverage. I'm going to play a quick video with some video highlights. And then, uh, and then we'll wrap up. A new challenge is shining a light on how difficult life can be without access to a car. Today is the first day of the Week Without Driving Challenge. The goal is to have all of us and our local leaders develop a better understanding of life for those who don't own a vehicle. A Week Without Driving continues today in La Crosse with more free rides. This week, the city of La Crosse is celebrating Week Without Driving with a special bingo game and by also offering free rides. Starting today, it's the nationwide Week Without Driving. And King County is hosting this challenge with more than 123 communities and cities. So member Claudia Balducci says across the board, about 30% of people don't have a car. That's why she and the council proclaimed the next seven days as the week without driving. In Humboldt County, it almost feels impossible to get from point A to point B 
without a car. But those with disabilities and those who cannot afford to drive face that challenge every day. Challenging, trying to figure out how we were going to get to music appointments, to school, to doctor's appointments. The challenge isn't about not using a car. It's more about seeing what it's like not being able to have access to a car. A quarter of Rochester households don't have access to a personal vehicle. So for um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of Rochester households, this isn't really a choice. I'm standing at a bus stop in Seattle's Soto neighborhood that doesn't have a shelter over it. That's just one barrier. Disability Rights Washington wants the public and policymakers to become more aware of during its week without driving challenge. This week is a full circle moment for Durham Mayor Pro Tem Mark Anthony Middleton, who is taking the bus to and from City Hall, utilizing ride shares and walking to get around. Any city that's going to consider itself great, a great metropolis, has to cross the threshold where the city is negotiable without a call. All right. So, um, yeah, weekwithoutdriving.org if you want to sign up and learn more. Um, it's your chance to really experience what it's like to get around without driving. Also here, just um, putting some of my uh, social media handles up there if you want to follow and learn more. Uh, so a book coming out um, that really talks about the non-driver study um, and the data included in that digs in a little deeper. Um, so you can check that out. It's called When Driving is Not an Option. And that is the end of uh, my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, um, Marianne and Anna. And Jasmine, I saw your hand up. Do you still have a question? Oh, sure. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I missed this in the very beginning, but did you, in the driver survey, the statewide driver survey, was information collected that looked at things at all or could organize them on a county level? I was just curious. If yeah, well, that's a great question. And the secondary piece of it was the rural definition, because for some purposes, our whole county might be designated as rural. And other times you might have been at a census tract level or a functional level. So if you could address both of those. Yeah, thanks. Okay, the first question, and, and I was asked, you know, to be able to see if I could tease out the data for Thurston County. Unfortunately, it was designed to be balanced across the state, so it wouldn't really be an, a represented appropriate use. We had about 100 responses from Thurston County. Um so, but it could certainly be, rep, you know, this type of analysis could certainly be replicated, you know, the, the process could certainly be replicated in Thurston County um, with other types of sampling. So, so not for the survey, the mapping piece that I talked about, though, which I'll share the link. So the links are in the report to the interactive maps. That analysis can be looked at for Thurston County. That's like census block level analysis. Um, Urban versus rural. I don't remember off the top of my head how we made the distinction. I believe. Oh, uh, I'll have to look it up and get back to you. We did something. It was either. Um, it was either the growth management boundaries or. I believe it was. Uh, I have to get back to you. I'm sorry. I can't remember off the top of my head, Renee. But we did a standard process where um, we looked, I think it, it could have been census block level density. I can't remember specifically. I'll have to go back and look. No worries. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? And that was our contact info. Leaving it up. Oh, for great. Minutes. Good. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, one, one. Is that Michelle? Yeah. Oh, John. Go okay, ahead. And thank then you. we'll get to Michelle. Uh, going through all of this work, have you come up with any kind of conclusions? Any kind of suggestions on what an area like this can do? So, um, so the non-driver analysis was specifically not designed for any policy recommendations. So by design, we were asked to not make any policy recommendations. So the conclusions from the non-driver analysis were more in terms of just responses to the initial you know, study design, which was like, who are the non-drivers? What are their reasons for non-drivers? 
what's their access to life opportunities and um, what's the impact of that access and their non-driver status. And so we drew our conclusions based on um, strictly to what was in the proviso, but that, and then the recommendations you'll see in the non-driver study are more for future analysis, right? So I think that one thing we miss, but is totally worth considering is like additional analysis at county scale, right? You know, stuff like that. Um, the reason Manuel and I have been working, well, there's lots of reasons we've been co-presenting with Anna. Um, her work, right, tells more of the story and then um, has some of those policy recommendations. Uh, this is, was a really informative presentation, and it's um, you can't look at it without recognizing uh, the very simple need for sidewalks. Um, Michelle. Sorry, I'm having system resource issues. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're, uh, we're having a hard time hearing you. Sorry. This is on a um, one other piece, just on the the sort of policy acts. I think you know, connected, accessible sidewalks is a big one. Reliable, frequent transit, um, you know, is another one. And then, really, the big ask from our end is how do you involve non drivers more in decision making? And and so. Whether you work for an agency, um, maybe that means thinking about, you know, your licensing requirements. Um, are you requiring driver's license in your jobs postings? How can you recruit and retain more folks with disabilities, um, more folks who don't have the privilege of driving into your agency, into the into the work that you do? And then, you know, in 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 um, I think there's also, you know, how do you how do you involve community members in decision making um, who perhaps, you know, aren't looking for full-time employment, but you know, looking at that expertise, how do you do that? I would say inner city transit is actually something that we point to as a leader in the state for uh, you know, involving community in, in the transit board. There's you know, three voting seats for, um, for community members. Uh, that is a piece of legislation we tried to pass this session. Um, and Olympia got through the Senate and House transportation committees, didn't get a floor vote in the Senate. So um, unfortunately that did not pass. Um, but that's something we'll be working on again next year because we think, you know, while you know it's important to have elected leaders on these uh, these transit boards, having folks who actually ride transit as part of that decision making structure is is important as well. And so that's um, a big policy piece we're working on. And uh, inner city transit is leading the way there. I I think Michelle might have dropped off and is trying to come back in. Has anyone seen her? Michelle Murray. I noticed that she dropped as well, but no, I have not yeah. seen, seen her. her come back. Uh, I hate for her not to get to ask her question or, or share her her thoughts. So, but I'm not. Well, we could her. also we could follow up and see if uh, she, and we could swap emails to connect. If yeah, it, for... yeah, yeah, she's uh, welcome to follow up. Uh, thanks for that, Mark, uh, because I'm sure she has some um, some insights on this uh, topic. Um, with that, uh, Paul, you are up next. We're taking a look at the Federal Transportation Grant Allocation for Shared Use Trail Preservation Projects. This is a big <laughs> issue, so it'll be it'll be fun to catch up. Well, good good morning, uh, board members. I'm Paul Brewster, Senior Planner, and I manage TRPC's federal transportation call for projects process. And give me a minute here just to get my screen sharing set up for my presentation. Hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so one of our primary functions that is uh, TRPC as an agency um, is to uh, program federal transportation funding to priority projects and TRPC, the council has discretion for what policies and priorities 
it chooses in terms of its selection process to move the needle in transportation that best serves the needs of our communities here in Thurston County. And I'm going to kind of give a kind of a high level overview of our call for projects process today because it it's 2024, we're going to be uh, issuing a call for projects around June. And so over the next few months, the TPB will have several touch points in informing our call for projects process and leading to a recommendation to the council. So let's just talk about the schedule. So today we're specifically going to be talking about a trail preservation set aside. It's not an action item. This is uh, just for you to start the conversation so that in April we'll come back to you with a proposal for the call for projects details, how much funding we're planning to set aside, what our funding priorities are, our uh, selection criteria, um, and how the TPB will be involved in forwarding a recommendation to the council. So next month you'll see our uh, trail preservation set aside included in those process details. We expect that you'll still want to have some more discussion and inform uh, our, our process. So in May, um, we have you scheduled to have that second review and then forward a process recommendation to the council so that the council takes action on that in June so that we're launching our call for projects process in June for about a month. And as you can see from the rest of the schedule, there's a lot of steps involved with doing public comment period, having our technical advisory committee do a peer review, staff scoring the applications. And I don't want to go through all this because we'll talk about this more next month, but I just want to set the stage that expect that you'll be hearing from TRPC staff over the next few months on this call for projects process. And today is just your first conversation point on this. So what you have before is a proposal and council member O'Callaghan was talking about what, what's the policy basis for the non-driver study? Well, I think this conversation today, that, that data and that presentation by Marianne and Anna is very applicable to the conversation we're having today to take a policy consideration for part of our active transportation network that serves a variety of users in our community. So the question that the policy board has raised, and this was first raised really in 2022 as part of our 2022 call for projects when we were revising our selection criteria, the policy board really raised this question is, should we set aside some funding of our federal grant programs to be used exclusively for trail preservation? And the question is sort of dangling out there, should this be an ongoing sustainable um, set aside in every funding cycle or just 2024? And, and hold on to that. We're going to talk more about that. But this funding initiative that the policy board floated really aligns with a lot of the goals and policies in our regional transportation plan. So specifically, our multimodal transportation system, you know, we're working towards an integrated system that supports our adopted land use policies, reduces the overall need to drive alone, encourages transit, walking, and cycling as choices. That supports barrier-free, ensuring that our network, which includes our shared use trail network, supports special needs, um, special travel needs for youth, elders, people with disabilities, literacy, or language barriers based on their incomes and other affected groups. Uh, trail maintenance and repair that we we want to protect those investments that we've already made and keep our life cycle costs as low as possible. Transportation demand management, increasing the overall operating efficiency of our system uh, through effective measures that reduce the need to drive. So that can be messaging, but it can also be just investments in supporting multiple choices that uh, multiple modes that people can choose to use to meet their daily needs. And bicycling and walking both around increasing the share of those trips that are made by bicycling and walking. So this, this conversation about a set aside has further matured uh, through the development of the regional trails plan. This policy board proposal has led to a policy recommendation 
in the regional trails plan, and that is to evaluate the effectiveness of establishing a, a set aside from TRPC's federal transportation grant programs to fund trail network pavement preservation projects. So there is precedent for the Transportation Policy Board in advising the council and forwarding recommendations on earmarks uh, for projects that the, the board deems as priorities for our region. Some notable ones are the Shalis Western Trail Bridging the Gap project. Back in 2001 and 2004 in each funding cycle, the Policy Board recommended setting aside $500,000, a half a million in each of those cycles um, to be used exclusively for advancing the construction of three bridges across I-5, Martin Way, and Pacific Avenue. And we achieved that, largely due to the policy board um, championing that project over time and ensuring it was completed through the funding programs that we had. When we first received congestion mitigation air quality improvement program funding, um, in 2012, the policy board recommended a regional approach for a smart corridors project to evaluate how we can better move transit along some of our strategy corridors and primary corridors in North Thurston County and, and enable technologies for transit signal prioritization. That was 2.63 million. There was continued funding to the smart corridors project over time. Hub Junction project, uh, the policy board recommended 50,000 in 2014 as a commemorative project to highlight the, the regional efforts that were done to complete the bridging the gap and construct the Chehalis Western Trail and the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail. So at that roundabout where those two trails intersect, there's a kiosk, some seating, a region's first trail roundabout, a solar powered uh, weather vane themed light. Um, and lastly, the Rural Community Support Program, which has received ongoing support um, made possible by Thurston County and, and recommended by the Policy Board in 2016-2020 and a set aside for our 2024 process to fund priority projects in our South County rural communities. But it it kind of goes beyond that. Um, TRPC beyond these earmarks has continued to make investments in our region's shared use trails in, in nearly every phase from performing feasibility studies to financing preliminary engineering and design, acquiring what the right of way, construction and even enhancements like doing um, milepost markers, wayfinding signage, landscaping. One the one sort of phase or element that TRPC has not really invested in on our trail network, but it's done for roadways is preservation and maintenance. So it's really an opportune time to have that discussion. So just some of the challenges we have with trail maintenance, and this is highlighted in the staff report. Um, you all know this, we, we receive a lot of rainfall, abundant rainfall, we have a long growing season we like uh, our trails to uh, have nice forested surroundings and, and landscaped, but with that comes the cost of if um, trails aren't initially properly constructed, they're subject to trees nearby, the, the roots burrow under the trail and lift and crack the pavement surface as you see in this photo. If, if left unattended and uh, not taken care of, um, these uneven surfaces lead to stormwater pool and further pavement degradation. Further, if they're not swept and well-maintained, um, basically nature has taken it back. And we have a few instances of trails here in Thurston County that have reached that poor state of condition. But what we want to focus on today is really how can we get ahead of trails reaching that state like you see in this slide. We also just have normal wear and tear of trails. I mean, over time um, from just regular use, but also vandalism affects our trailheads, uh, trail surfaces, um, our, our seating, our signage. Fortunately, most of our trails are in a, in a state of good repair, but we do have some older segments that are, that are not, that are far from optimal. They present hazards and they also really degrade people's experience from using our trails. 
some of the benefits that come with trail maintenance is, first of all, making them safer, reducing those hazards. Um, you know, those large bumps, um, if they're covered with debris, um, create risks for trips and falls, or if someone's biking, falls on their bike, that can also cause damage to one's bicycle. It improves accessibility. You know, imagine um, someone who's using a walker or a wheelchair. Um, th those dips, cracks, and bumps really present a challenge for people with disabilities to use our trail network. Um, maintaining life cycle costs, that early preservation, if, if, if it's done uh, early and regularly, it reduces those more costly rehabilitative repairs. And so we want to try to maximize our return on investment by um, just ongoing uh, pavement preservation maintenance as it's needed, staying on top of it, having an asset management plan. It improves overall user satisfaction, both for, for whatever the, the trip purpose is on the trail. Our trails are largely used for recreation, but people use trails also for commuting, exercise, fitness, uh, going out, just being in nature, wildlife viewing. And people come from outside Thurston County to visit our trails. They, they'll travel from surrounding counties to visit and use the Chehalis Western Yelm Rainier Tenino trails. So they are an attraction. Um, they do generate revenue for people who come visit our community and spend time here. So we want our trails to continue being an attraction, not just to serve our communities, but to draw on people from outside the community. So a little bit on the existing condition of our network. Um, we have 59 miles of developed shared use paths. These are trails that are paved. Most of this network is in satisfactory condition, but we do have two corridors, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in the next slides, totaling 2.3 miles that are really in poor condition. These exemplify what is the worst of our trail network. However, even though we have a recommendation in the regional trails plan for trail managing agencies to assess the existing condition of, uh, of pavement, of those assets on the trails, um, those comprehensive assessments have not been performed to a state that we're able to roll up for you what is the state of good repair or what is the unfunded overall need for trail remediation. That, that's something we don't have yet. That's something we're working toward. So we'll have to have continued conversations about what is the long-term plan for the maintenance of our trails. That is something that will come after our 2024 call for projects. But we know that there are trails now that would benefit from a set aside. And just to point out, this is something that is very evident. Thurston County owns and operates two thirds of our existing trail network. So with over 60%, Thurston County holds the lion's share and something that came up in our regional trails plan development process is Thurston County is really takes a, a conservative approach with its trail development. So it, it really, wants to forward think on as it develops the trail network, it wants to ensure that it can also maintain that network. So here's um, the Ralph Monroe Evergreen Parkway Trail. Looking at this map, this is um, a trail that parallels Evergreen Parkway. It's called the Old Evergreen Parkway Trail because this really is the oldest shared use trail in existence in Thurston County. It's believed to have been developed whenever the state developed Evergreen Parkway leading out to the Evergreen State College. It's on, if you're traveling from 101 to Evergreen, it's on the right side, it's on the northbound lane. It's really out of sight because it's uh, obscured from the roadway view by a, a buffer of forest that over time has grown. And I'll say as, uh, as an Evergreen student rode this trail um, nearly 30 years ago, that it was in poor state back then. Mm -hmm. And the county has inherited this trail from the state and it's still well used. It's used by residents who uh, live in the area who can connect to the Evergreen Parkway itself, to the Ralph Monroe Trail and to trails around the Evergreen State College campus. I was out there just a couple of weeks ago and noticed several 
um, community members out walking on the trail and it, it still has has a useful life cycle to it. However, it is it does suffer from those tree root bumps mm -hmm. that you see here, excess organic debris. And part of the problem is these these uh, entrances to these trails are controlled by Jersey barriers and there's no means for the county to get a sweeper in there, but just something as simple as getting a sweeper in there, clearing some of this trail would make it more visible and safer and more enjoyable for users. But but this facility in itself is beyond a state of a uh, of pavement preservation. This is a trail that would really require like grinding this out and really regrading and doing this trail. So this would be an expensive investment to do. And until Thurston County makes a decision about what its long-term goals are for this facility, this is not really an ideal project right now as part of our, our set aside. Thurston County is weighing its options. One option is yes, reconstructing it or possibly uh, converting it to a natural uh, surface pathway. Hey, and I see that there's a question. I yeah. see there's a question. I'm, yeah. If I may just get through it and then I'll take questions sure. if that's all right. I was just gonna Thank ask you. you that, so thanks. Yep. Uh, next is the, this is the I-5 bicycle trail. Um, the larger photo that you're looking at, this is looking um, east. This is near the uh, Boulevard Road where Boulevard Road connects to the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail. So this is a segment that parallels the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail from Boulevard Road um, up to Pacific Avenue near the I-5 on-ramp. This was a trail, uh, our second oldest shared use path in Thurston County it was constructed by Washington Department of Transportation in the mid 1980s. It was done as mitigation for the expansion of I-5. There's an agreement between WashDOT and the cities of Lacey and Olympia for the cities to maintain and operate the trail surface and WashDOT is responsible for the fencing and the landscaping. And this is a trail that has um, suffered quite a bit from uh, lack of maintenance. And the regional trails plan has a recommendation for Washington Department of Transportation, Olympic Region, um, and the cities and TRPC to discuss what is, what, what's the best use of this corridor uh, for future use because it parallels the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail. It is worth exploring, um, perhaps decommissioning this segment and adding a new connection to maintain that connection to the Pacific Avenue crossing that further uh, connects to the I-5 bicycle trail that continues up to the Shalis Western Trail. But as you can see from this photo, um, we have uh, tree root, Infestation that's caused excessive cracking, lifting, stormwater ponding. Um, it hasn't been swept in years. Um, it, it suffers from excess litter and, and vandalism on the trail. It really is not an inviting trail to use compared to some of our more popular trails like the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail and the Shalis Western Trail. And last trail here is really, I think, what is the focus of our conversation? This is um, the Shalis Western Trail. If any of you have been on it and you walk uh, the, the, the stretch just near ch um, the Chambers Lake Trailhead, you'll see that the county has done some crack sealing work. Um, there's been patches that, of uh, pavement that have been done on sections of uh, like the Yelm Rainier to Nino Trail. But what you're looking at in these images are sort of characteristics of the early signs of um, longitudinal and latitudinal damage to the trail surface. As you can see on the photo on the left, we got some cracking there. In fact, someone has gone out, some community member has gone out, a trail user, and has spray painted um, sections of cracks to make them stand out more along the trail. The photo on the right is showing when you get some of that root uplifting, you got you start to see some bumps, you start to see some ponding occurring. This is an opportunity for some intervention to do some trail preservation work. So this is likely the type of um, uh, scenario that we would see in a trail preservation project addressing. So let's talk about the funding that we have available. 
So I first want to orient you to um, the map on the left. And this is showing our urban area, which is the light green of Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, our North County area. This is designated as our urban large based on US Census. This is where we have 200 or more thousand people living in this part of the county. Second is the urban small. That's that darker forest green color that you see around um, Yelm city limits and the Grand Mound Rochester sub area. And then lastly, we have the rural area, the light green, um, unincorp largely unincorporated Thurston County, but also includes um, Bucota, Rainier, Tenino, and, and parts of Yelm. So we're required by WashDOT as we award funding to make sure that we're programming a minimum amount of funding to each of these geographic areas. So now referencing the table to the right, we have our surface transportation block grant, the first column, followed by transportation alternatives, which is that STBG set aside. It's a share of STBG funds that is specifically used for smaller scale active transportation projects, historic preservation, other eligible project types that I'll get into in more detail next month. And lastly, the third column, carbon reduction program funding. And across the that first gray row is our staff's preliminary estimate. This is a conservative estimate of the amount of funding that we expect to program in our 2024 call for projects. We expect to hear from WashDOT local programs next month what our 2024 allocation is. That will influence the amount that we'll have to program. So we'll give you an update when we have it. But for now, we're looking at about a total of 7.2 million in STBG and transportation alternatives that we'll be programming for 2028 through 2030. And one point one and a half million for the carbon reduction program that we'll be programming earlier for 2025 through 2027. And so these are the amounts. These are the percentage breakdowns of the areas by which we need to program funding out to. Um, the spoiler alert here in my presentation is that staff is recommending that we use the carbon reduction program funds as uh, the source of revenue to create that set aside. This carbon reduction program funds came out of the bipartisan infrastructure law, programmed out through 2026. We're unlikely to see it again, but these are funds that are des designated to projects to reduce transportation emissions defined as carbon dioxide emissions from on-road and transportation sources. And there's a, there are challenges with how we would potentially program five, nearly a half million in rural carbon reduction program funds um, and we think that that combination of 421,000 in urban and half million in rural is, is a good match for the use of these funds. And, and CRP as well as STBG and transportation alternatives, all sources of these or these funding pots can be used for trail preservation projects. And I'm, I'm nearing the end of my presentation here. So, um, Technical Advisory Committee, they're recommending that it's, it's preferred that at least around a million dollars for a federally funded project to, to have that be a successful project. Thurston County believes that it has, um, it can put together a package of urban and rural uh, trail preservation needs on its trails that could take advantage of that funding, that set aside to do some, uh, have a major impact on um, the state of our, our trails. Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, and Yelm, their trails are all in fairly good shape. They have no immediate trail preservation needs that could really leverage this set aside by 2030. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the TAC is really prefers that we uh, not use STBG funds, that those STBG funds be used for other priority transportation projects. And there was concerns raised by the TAC members about the competitiveness of transportation alternative grant proposals 
if we use the TA funds as the set aside. So that's that's why staff is leaning towards using the CRP funds as well. And long term, there still needs to be more work to address what the long term uh, preservation needs are to develop an asset management plan. Thurston County Public Works staff believes that they will have a better idea of what their trail preservation asset management plan will be by the end of this year. But also good news is Thurston County has started to set aside 200,000 a year specifically for trail maintenance from its real estate excise tax program. So as outlined in the staff report, our, we, we offer some staff recommendations to help inform your conversations and consider um, this policy funding decision. Staff were saying, it, encourage a project middle somewhere in the range of 800,000 to $1 million that could be used for the set aside, utilize the carbon reduction program, um, this ensures the competitiveness for other transportation alternatives, such as maybe uh, another trail project that could come in or preserving funding for another priority like inner city transits, walk and roll youth education program. Um, if we have one, a single applicant come in, that that would be prioritized as a top funding. If we happen to have more than one applications come in for trail preservation, that you would use our process evaluation criteria to assess the priority proposal to be funded. So here's your discussion points for today that staff is looking for input from you on. Um, we're looking for you. What do you think is an appropriate funding level for impactful results and the sort of really putting a, a, a good fix on our trail network? Um, figuring out what, what is that right amount of funding um, and how you'd want to go about prioritizing a, a trail preservation project. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, open it up for questions, and uh, leave it to you, Renee, to, to lead the discussion. Kind of moderate here. Um, that last slide presented a, a number of key considerations that maybe at some point we'll be able to go back to. Uh, Robert, you're up first, and then we'll go to Jessica. Um, actually, can I get the slide of the Evergreen Trail up for a quick second? I have a question regarding we'll that. We'll do. Yep, give me a second here to go back to it. Is this the one, Robert? Yeah. So my question is, have we considered, um, I realized that the Evergreen State the Campus, they took out a lane years ago and added a, a separated uh, lane there for walking and cycling. Have they, have we just considered extending that all the way down to Harrison instead of trying to fix a trail that's all bendy? Just taking a, taking part of the, the parkway and extending a separated track all the way down instead of just trying to, because it would be more direct. You know, as someone who was an Evergreen student, I would dangerously go up the parkway from Harrison because I that that trail is just not not doable for access. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. You're asking, has Evergreen um, considered or the state considered replicating that cross section that you see from Kaiser Road um, to to the campus, uh, continue that um, all basically way all the way down to Harrison. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of that conversation taking place. Um, it it could be considered, I, I would say, the major difference um, for that southern segment from 17th Avenue, northwest south to um, Harrison Avenue is that is a 50 mile an hour speed limit along that route. Yeah. And it, it is preferred by many to have some buffer uh, away from the roadway, which which you do have along Kaiser, but I don't think there has been any discussion to do that, but it's, it's something that we could evaluate as part of our uh, bicycle connectivity strategy study that we are just kicking off right now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jessica. First, a comment. Thank you so much for that presentation. And actually, 
all the presentations today have been great. And um, it seems to me to be a no-brainer that we need to maintain our trails. We've invested in creating them, even though we had assistance from other funding sources. And it's crazy not to maintain them and keep them going as we go, as opposed to piecemeal, oh, we have an urg urgent issue here. So, and as a trail user, I see the issues crop, crop up on trails all the time. So um, my question is, I'm not clear on how much is being recommended per year, or do we just not know that yet? Yeah, great question, Jessica. I should say we're, for fun. We're only right now looking at a recommendation for our 2024 funding cycle. Um, so we would be soliciting a proposal for a project if it used CRP funds, it would need to obligate sometime between 2025 and 2027. Thurston County has indicated they could do that. If we were to use our surface transportation block grant or transportation alternatives, it would be for years 2028 through 2030, because that's just how, how the funds are allocated and the, the timeline we're programming out to. Beyond 2024, we were unable to, we don't have the data or the information yet from our uh, trail managing agencies as to what their longer term needs are. So until there is a more systemic assessment of their network needs over time, we're not uh, asking the TPB to consider um, a year over year or funding cycle over funding cycle set aside. Okay, thank you. That helps clarify. Jasmine. Thank you. Um, I very much understand uh, the recommendation to potentially program climate funds if that's one of the only eligible sources to fund trail preservation. The conversation, though, makes me wonder, um, not to undermine this recommendation, but just to have that information, if we have, and I'm sure you have, I'm just catching up, explored or or is there a study that kind of shows bang for the buck um, carbon reduction projects? And if so, if staff could share that with me just for my awareness. Yeah, we have a couple. So our call for projects criteria um, includes a greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but it's based on project types. It is it is difficult to quantify the long-term net climate or greenhouse gas reduction benefits from projects. However, active transportation projects tend to score really well because they don't uh, emit uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but in, in our call for projects, as we receive applications, that's something we consider in terms of what are the uh, climate benefit impacts from projects. And we, we try to present that information to the policy makers for consideration and evaluating projects. May I have a follow-up question? Of course. To make sure I understand. So we use it as, to, as a way to prioritize or rank types of projects against each other when you call for projects, but there's not sort of any proactive planning document that has identified like places where there's choke points or where investment might um, make a bigger difference. It's only if it comes to the board, right, for, for review. Correct. We, we have Federal Highways Administration has specific project, project activities or eligible types of projects that the funds can be used for. As a region, we have not done any type of comprehensive study to look at where on our transportation network or what types of investments we could do that would deliver the greatest bang for our investment in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. However, we do have climate mitigation plan, our regional transportation plan, regional trails plan that do have like policy recommendations to advance our overall greenhouse gas reduction goals. Also, just to to pile on quickly, um, we have exactly the kind of study that you're identifying, Commissioner, as an unfunded need in our unified planning work 
program to take what's been done in the climate mitigation plan and look specifically at the transportation sector and how best to reduce carbon from the transportation sector. So that is, uh, you'll be hearing about that as an unfunded need um, as we start talking about the Unified Planning Work Program next meeting. Oh, terrific. I will miss that meeting, but I'm going to make sure someone from Port of Olympia can cover it. And thank you so much. Well, and make sure you get the recording too, because it'll be interesting. Um, Katrina, I saw your hand up as well. No, Mark covered it. We're okay, good. very good. Uh, any other questions of Paul before we move forward? I don't see any other hands. So I will take this opportunity to remind you that our next meeting is April 10th, and it will primarily be in person at the offices of uh, TRPC. And uh, there will be a remote option available for those who prefer to attend that way. Uh, anything else from you, Mark? No, thank you. Okay, uh, with that, John, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Non-debatable motion. Thank you so much. Uh, and great to see you all and look forward to seeing uh, many of you in person next week.